Hello, everyone, and welcome to the College Admissions Collaborative highlighting, highlighting Engineering and Technical Technology College Fair and Event. <laughs> we have some fantastic schools here with us, especially Kettering University. My name is Kelsey, and I will be your facilitator. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. Your camera and microphone are off, so the panelists cannot see or hear you. You can use the Q&A button on your screen to type your questions to our presenters at any time. This is just one of the many different sessions happening this week, so be sure to check on the schedule on our website. This presentation is being recorded and will be available at strivescan.com, um, and I'd now like to turn it over to our school, Kettering University. Thank you all. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our session on prepping for pathways into robotics and artificial intelligence. Uh, my name is Bree Baker. I am an admissions counselor here at Kettering University, located in Flint, Michigan, um, and I will be moderating today's session. So uh, before we get started, I just want to remind you all to feel free to use the Q&A uh, at the bottom of your screen to ask questions throughout this panel. Uh, we primarily are focusing this around your questions and what you would like to learn from, uh, from our panelists here. So feel free to do that at any time. Um, but and just a reminder that this will be recorded and we'll send this out uh, at a later date as well. So uh, with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to Nathan Cover to introduce himself. Perfect, thank you, Bree. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me, uh, but nice to meet all of you. I see a few students are rolling into our session here, so that's great. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, my name is Nathan Kober, and I'm uh, wearing a couple of hats here at Kettering University. I work in the admissions office and, and help with recruitment and the application and scholarship process for prospective students. Um, and then I also am a co-op manager, and so I work with uh, employers um, that work with Kettering students to hire them for their co-op experiences. So I'm going to share just a quick slide to kind of give you a quick overview of, of what our academic calendar looks like. And then that kind of can help frame maybe some of our conversation about getting, you know, uh, down the, these career pathways. So let me just share that real quickly and then we'll jump into a few other things. Okay. Should be able to see that now. And I'll just go to present. Oops. Maybe there we go. Okay. So I'm going to jump just to this slide mainly because I wanted to explain our academic calendar and how that um, kind of helps students prepare for for their careers or whatever that that may be. But for this specific conversation. Um, in automation, artificial intelligence, engineering, and, and different things. So um, our academic calendar is broken down into four quarters, um, four three-month terms. And so we have two student bodies that rotate between school and work for three months at a time. Um, <clears throat> the students that are working at a co-op site are with uh, vetted employers. They're also paid opportunities for the students, uh, typically anywhere from $15 to $20 an hour. And then ultimately, our goal of our co-op program is to allow the students to, to have full-time offers on the table before they even graduate. So kind of a unique academic calendar. And so I wanted to highlight uh, two things here, our academic majors, as well as our kind of academic calendar and give, give the students a visual um, as well. So with that being said, I can answer questions about kind of how, how that all works related to co-ops. Um, but Bri, I'll let you introduce and, and connect with our faculty as well. <laughs> Great, thank you. I'll go ahead and Dr. Farmer, if you would like to introduce yourself. Sure, hi guys. Uh, I'm Mike Farmer. I'm the uh, department head for computer science and a professor of computer science at, at Kettering. Um, I've been in academia for 15 years, 16 years now. And prior to that, I was in industry for 20 years, 10 years in aerospace, um, that's basically defense, and 10 years in automotive. Uh, been doing AI things for a long time. My first, to show you how old I am uh, and how old AI is, my first um, AI algorithm I developed was in 1988. So none of you were born, probably some of your parents weren't even born yet. Um, 
but yeah, so I've been doing this for a long time. So I'm looking forward to, to questions from you guys and looking forward to coming to Kettering and, and working with us in, in AI. We've got a lot of cool things going on, a lot of classes, a few new classes that we're starting to roll out as well. And it's it's become really just a just an active, vibrant uh, AI environment right now. So perfect timing on, on your guys' part to think about coming to Kettering. Thank you very much. And Dr. Peters, you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Dr. Diane Peters, and uh, I have some similarities in my background to Dr. Farmer uh, in that we both uh, spent some time in industry, but I'm a mechanical engineer rather than a computer scientist, which means I know enough about programming to be dangerous. Um, I use it uh, a bit, but I wouldn't claim to be an expert. Uh, and one of my areas in particular is controls, which does link up with AI, especially through autonomous vehicles. I'm the primary faculty advisor for the Auto Drive Challenge. And that is a competition where we're uh, taking on the small task of making a car drive itself. And AI plays into that a lot because that's one of the ways that we perceive the world around us. Before we can control a vehicle, we have to know what's around it and what we wanna control it to do. And so we have a lot of very tough problems that AI can help with in terms of identifying where the stop signs and the stop lights and all of those things that we kind of take for granted uh, just what our human human senses and brains can do. Awesome, thank you very much. So I'll go ahead and get the ball rolling here as questions start coming in. So um, we can go in the order that we went or if anyone wants to jump in in particular, that's fine. But First question, why should students be considering careers in STEM? Okay, I think we all have something to say about that. Uh, but I would say that, that one of the reasons is just because they are both well-paid careers and they are intensely rewarding. You make a very good salary. Um, you have, a nice, you, you have a nice ability to earn a good living, but you're also doing something that is really, really cool. I'm not going to claim it's easy because it's not. But the things that you can accomplish, there, there's something really special about looking at something that's a product and saying, hey, I did that. That was my creation. My thing that I put out into the world. That is really, really cool. Yeah, exactly. So I've got 26 patents actually from my industry days. So I've developed a lot of cool things. And one of the things I did was uh, um, something for Navy ships for their radar displays. And it's actually on every single Navy ship right now. So whenever we go to vacation, like we used to go to Virginia Beach a lot and you'd see all the aircraft carriers all lined up. And uh, my kids just got such a kick out of me putting each of the ship and go, yeah, there's three of my radars on that one. There's two of my radar displays on that one. There's a few of them on that one. And I can't even tell you what I put on that one because it's classified. So that it's just such a fun thing. And likewise, my, my wife actually works in automotive and she's done some algorithms for safety. And it's fun when you drive the car and she goes, watch this. And, we, and she shakes the wheel and what in the car, you know, stabilizes and things. But that's my algorithm doing that. And, and there's just, it, it, as Diane said, it's just the coolest thing when you actually can show your family and your friends and things, stuff that you had developed and it, it's out in the field and it's out maybe even saving lives or doing just cool things and, and making vehicles go. And, and, and that's just the coolest part about STEM. And, and it's, you know, especially with computing and things, it's pervasive now. So there's so many places where you can have things that you develop that show up in day-to-day in -day lives. I have friends who went from aerospace to pacemakers of all things. And so they've actually, you know, have software that they can say, yeah, I, you know, the this version we put together is, you know, save 5,000 more lives than the old one, you know, and, and, and those kind of things are just so meaningful and so profound that, you know, at the end of the day, you look back at what you did at work. Um, and it, it's just so meaningful because you've literally touched and changed and improved so many people's lives. It's just really cool. Yeah. And then I can just add a little, little perspective on how that all happens here at Kettering in our kind of academic experience. Um, the graduates from Kettering ultimately have two to two and a half years of work experience based on the co-ops they do throughout their time here. And some of those things, uh, you know, the projects that uh, our faculty are, are referencing, we have some students who have their hands in projects like this as undergraduate students when they're off co-oping at their work site. And so you do get to dabble in those things and, and start really seeing what, what is out there 
in industry and how you can make a career out of out of STEM. Um, the two things I'll, I'll add as to, to why STEM, yes, it pays really well in most cases was going to be my first point. Um, but secondly, the, the job market for STEM careers is exploding and going to continue to explode. You know, so you have uh, so many opportunities and then you combine that with the experience you gain during college and, and in particular at Kettering with the co-op experience, it helps define what career is going to be the most rewarding for you when you graduate for, from, from Kettering with your bachelor's degree. So a couple of things kind of to add there uh, as well, but yeah, definitely a lot of fun and, and the heart of what Kettering does is, is STEM oriented. So if you like STEM, you'll find a home here, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, Nathan, I like that you touched on um, the growth of STEM fields and, you know, teachers, in high school, I always talk about, oh, we're preparing you for jobs that don't even exist yet. And I feel like it's easy as a high school student to kind of be like, yeah, okay, whatever. But it's true. A lot of these positions that students even that are in college now, um, you know, that's, that's certainly on the horizon. Um, but we do have a question that just came in here. Uh, so how does a student figure out what path to take in an engineering major? So that's a really good question. Yeah, that, that is, and it's an important one because there's so many different options there. And one of the things to do is to just kind of think about what it is that you really want to do and then to try it. Uh, the co-op will help with that. And that's something that Nathan has talked about. And it's something that is a big thing about Kettering is that you get that experience working, but your classes help too, talking to professors. So if somebody says, you know, I like this, I like that, let me talk to some people, they can get an idea, especially from the faculty with work experience about what kinds of things they've done, and that will help to narrow it down. I was very fortunate when I was considering what do I want to do, I knew I wanted something in the STEM fields. Uh, it was actually my father who looked at what I was interested in and said, you know, I've seen what the engineers at work do. He's a chemist. And he said, I think you would like one of these particular fields. And so I kind of said, well, I'll try mechanical engineering and it ended up working out. I'm, I'm sure there are other areas that would have worked out as well, but that one worked for me. And uh, Dr. Farmer, Mike might have a, a few comments on how he chose what he wanted. Well, yeah, I was originally a theoretical physicist. So mine was quite a bit different path. <laughs> So yeah, um, that's why I got into computers because I realized that that basically all theoretical physicists did was work on computer code all day long. Um, and I realized I could do a lot more fun stuff than just one at, one piece of code for seven years. I could work on a lot of different things if I got out of physics and went into computer science. So I'm actually a good poster child for don't worry so much about what you want, what you think you want to be right now, because you'll probably change your mind. Um, and that's cool because um, that's one of these things too about Kettering. You got so many different fields we can go into in the in the co-ops that there's a lot of overlap so you don't have to worry too that oh I've got a co-op in electrical and I decided I want to be a computer engineer uh, you know most of these companies have a lot of uh, parallel paths and things so it's really easy for you to transition your your major without a lot of without a lot of drama um, and I you know I'm one of those um, you know, I guess problem childs, I actually encourage people to think about changing majors. I know some of the parents go, oh, don't change your major. You know, um, there's nothing wrong with changing your major. If you're 18 and know exactly what you're doing, you may not actually know what it is the field is right now. You may, you know, you may have only a very narrow view um, and it may change too. And, you know, for example, you know, Dr. Peters in mechanical engineering, it's a really wild field because you've got the traditional thermal fluids crowd and you got the vibrations crowd and now you got the really cool control stuff, you know, which one could argue maybe that should have even been in computer engineering. It's, it's in, but it's in mechanical and there's a lot of really famous people actually involved in that. Um, this guy Coleman who developed the Coleman filters, it, it, a mechanical engineer back in, I think Berkeley or Stanford, I forget, but um, you know, so there's a lot of overlap too. So if you think, well, I really like computers, I better go into computer science. Well, can, like you know, Dr. Peter said, controls people in mechanical do a decent amount of embedded programming. Computer engineers do a lot of programming. It's just they tend to have hardware stuff too. Or so if you don't 
necessarily like hardware if you're if, uh, you like me and every time you touch hardware smoke starts to come out you probably want to stay in the the computer science side of things and just do the software and you know and save the the fire drills at your facility um but i like to joke a little bit but it's you know the idea is it's it's fun and, and there's a lot of different things you can do and there is a lot of overlap so it's it's really not one of these deals where you're going to be you got to decide now and you're going to be doing it for 30 years it's it's it just doesn't work that way there's so much overlap in these fields and they're so dynamic and so so you know changing so rapidly that um you'll find yourself actually having once you graduate taking even more classes trying to keep up with the with the industry as opposed to you know just worrying about what you want to be and you'll find I'm, i would love for you to come back as an alumni in 15 years and tell us what you thought you were going to be and what you ended up being um, and I think that'd be really fun to look to if you could see your future self and see the difference you'd be like oh wow I had no idea like you know uh, Brian mentioned careers that don't even exist are things you're going to be working on so you know, I'm jealous of you guys it, the, the, the opportunities are so vast and so crazy right now and so dynamic um, that you know just pick something and run with it you'll have a heck of a good time and who knows where you'll be like I said in, in 15 years but please come back as an alumni and, and, and show us all the cool stuff you did. Yeah, and I just wanted to throw maybe a follow-up question on there too, Bree, before we jump jump to the next one um, in regards to kind of how we do things. Because I think, you know, I before coming to Kettering, I was a high school college counselor. And so I find a lot of high school students don't know what being a mechanical engineering major in college means, even, you know, a computer science major, what that means and what that entails. So I guess my follow-up question for, for Dr. Peters and, and Dr. Farmer would maybe be to, to kind of just give, if you can, a, a brief outline or nuts and bolts of, of maybe the first course or two within the, the major curriculum to give these students some sense of what, you know, at Kettering, we, we kind of throw you right into a, a course related to your major and in, in intro level course in your first term here. But maybe if we dive into that curriculum a little bit more, it'll give the students a bit more of a sense of, of what mechanical engineering is and, and computer science when it gets a bit more specific into the, the actual curriculum and the, the stuff they're learning. <clears throat> sure, I can give a brief high level overview of mechanical engineering. There's a couple of distinct areas within mechanical engineering. And as a major, you'll get exposed to all of them but you might choose that one of them is your favorite and you wanna go deeper with electives. So on the one hand, you have the mechanics kind of area. And one of the first classes you encounter then would be statics. Statics is things that don't move. Sounds kind of boring, but it's actually really interesting because that gives you an understanding of structures of things like bridges, or if you go to see the uh, Tigers play at uh, the ballpark, um, you'll look and you'll see there's a bunch of structures there, and that's all of the stuff that goes into those. Later on, you get into dynamics uh, and some of those other courses, mechanics of materials, which deals with, okay, uh, how do we know that this material is not going to break? And then you have uh, courses in things like machine design. So you can see here on my desk, I have this bearing. What kind of bearings do you use and where do you use them? Uh, we also have courses in thermal fluids that has to do with like the power cycles in an engine, flow of fluids in pipes, all of that kind of thing. And then there's my own area, which is dynamic systems and controls. And that's where you're developing the math that'll describe how things move. And then once you know how they move, you can design a controller to bend them to your will and make the universe obey you, or at least one machine in the universe. So that's kind of the high level overview of the whole thing. Cool, great fun. Yeah, so computer science, you you know, the, the language we speak is programming, right? So so just like if you're an English major, you'd learn how to write, you'd learn grammar, you'd learn structure and things like that. For computer science, our language is code. Uh, and so that's really where things start out. And, and our program is, a we're a Java house. Uh, so we, we predominantly uh, teach in Java. Um, we're starting an intro Python class for people who haven't had any programming, though, because Java is kind of a heavy language to, to, to help you kind of more gently get into the programming mindset. Um, so that's really the first two classes are, are Java 1 and 2. Um, the second Java, we teach about something called data structures. So we have structures just like Dr. Peters has, only ours are pretend, and they're only in code, and they never fall down. They crash a lot, but they 
only crashed gently. So um, it's much more civilized. Uh, so, um, but yeah, so so we have, you know, things like trees and graphs and all kinds of fun structures like that that we deal with to help us define problems so uh, even simple things like a chess game you can represent it as a tree structure finding your way to the grocery store the best path is a graph you know things that you just day to day just do you don't necessarily think about that there's actually an optimal mathematical model for that sort of stuff um, and so we teach you those things and we teach you how to code them and how to search through them and do things like that and that leads us into like the ai class where you learn algorithms related to to doing puzzles and doing games and then from games learning how to schedule jobs at a machine shop you know um uh, to do things like uh, can we even do controls but we we cheat we use fuzzy logic so you have to learn any of the equations you just code up a nice little fuzzy controller and and it runs and and you don't have to learn all those awful differential equations so but no it's a <laughs> My, I'd say it's easier, but you'd spend most of the time debugging and scratching your head going, why is the elevator just fly by the floor it's supposed to stop at when I know I had in there that it's supposed to stop. So, so we tend to have more embarrassing mistakes in our, in our code. Um, so we also teach like software engineering, how to design software systems. Um, we have class in cloud computing because everything's going up to the cloud now. We just put in a new class in parallel processing. We're going to teach you guys how to program on um, like uh, GPUs. Uh, that you might have in your gaming engines and things like that um, and just a lot of interesting things different ways to to run code in in you know in optimal ways and fast ways and, and to solve pretty much any problem you want to be uh, thrown into so that's our world perfect that was a really good question Nathan. thank you i think that was a a good segue um and so kind of we did get another question kind of related to um, the student is specifically looking about narrowing interest in computer science. Since we kind of touched on this, I wonder if we can broaden that and maybe see like as a high school student, what can they do in order to kind of narrow down their interest while they're in high school and to the student if we don't quite answer your question, let me know and I can I can ask it in a different way. I would say try things. You don't know if you're going to like things until you try them. So I would suggest if you think you, you would like doing a certain subfield, try it. See if you like it. Um, and if you discover you like it, great. That's not to say there aren't other things you would like, but now you've got at least one that you know you could be happy with. And if you discover it's not quite what you want, then try something else. Take what you learned from it. I know I like to do X and I don't like to do Y, so this isn't quite the right fit. So take that and use that to go elsewhere and try something new and keep trying things. And like everybody has said, you don't know what opportunities are gonna come 10 years from now. So you need to keep trying things throughout your whole life because the job you have when you graduate right out of college is not the job you will have 10 years afterwards. The job you're gonna have 10 years afterwards doesn't exist yet. And the job you get right out of college might not exist 10 years from now. So that's kind of a long-winded way of just say, saying, try things and keep trying things and then reflect on what you've learned from what you've tried. For sure. And, and an easy way to do that too in high school, remember, is you have your clubs and you also have your classes. Like, for example, here in West Bloomfield, we have, I think it's a four course sequence in engineering. Um, so they do things, they started with drafting and then they build up little prototypes and they, they build up even more complex prototypes and they do a lot of field trips to companies and things, which is super valuable. If you can, can jump on some of those and, and get to do tours of facilities and, and see things, um, that can be really, really helpful for you, for you thinking up ideas. Um, also, like if if you have like a VEX or FIRST Robotics, that'd be a great thing to get into. And if you're like, well, I don't know if I like robots. It's like, well, FIRST Robots are cool. You got to like robots. But the second, <laughs> second thing, there's a lot of aspects to robots. People think, oh, I don't like robots because I don't want to build stuff with my hands. Well, you know, just as Dr. Peter said in AutoDrive, a lot of it's AI and software. There's a lot in the robotics side that's software related. So you can do, you can be the group coder and literally never touch hardware. Or if you say, I really don't like coding, I want to be the, the person who thinks up how to put the thing, the structure together. That ties into more of the dynamics kind of things that, that Dr. Peter's talking about. Maybe you're lean towards the mechanical side and maybe you just want to dabble back and forth in which case you're probably maybe a computer engineer but those sorts of things give you really great opportunities to 
to safely try things and without a big commitment, right? If you don't like it, you just stop, you, know, you just drop out of the club. It's no big deal. Um, but um, they're relatively inexpensive. And I know a lot of high schools don't necessarily have first, but VEX, for example, um, a lot of schools are starting to do VEX stuff. And you could also buy really inexpensive VEX kits for yourself. Um, Hex Robotics, I don't know if you've heard of those, are the really cute little robots. Uh, my son was big into those in middle school. Um, and he's an EE now at, at Kettering, and he, he would build up all kinds of crazy little stuff. Um, and they're really fun and approachable. Um, there's also high school coding competitions. Um, a number of colleges, matter of fact, we're going to try to start doing one at Kettering next year, a high school hackathon, uh, where you can program little competitions and it, 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 like a college thing and, and compete against other local high schools and, and have fun stuff like that. And you also get to meet other people across high schools with interests and things. But definitely do the club right. I mean, aside from the fact that that you know, the admissions people will tell you it's great to have lots of clubs on your on your application and stuff that look, you know, quote, looks good, you know, for college. Um, but aside from that, I'm more of a practical guy. It, it, it feels good for you to do it because it's going to give you some insights into what you're good at. And it, and it frankly might be stuff you haven't even thought about yet. Um, so I really encourage you to try to, to, to get into some some interesting club things like that. I think it would be really valuable for you. Right. And just to add on to that, you know, kind of reemphasizing where the, the co-op piece comes into your education at Kettering. Um, as a freshman in college, you start co-oping at, at a workplace in industry, applying what you learned in the classroom and, and then also learning, you know, what kind of industry standards and projects and different opportunities exist. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, that's what going to also help define Yes, my college major is computer science, but what type of career or what type of maybe, you know, specific pathway with, within that broad umbrella of computer science best suits my, my passions and, and, you know, my goals as an individual as, as well. And I just wanted to highlight um, our academic program. So, you know, most schools will have varying different um, concentrations um, within kind of the, the major disciplines that a school offers, you know, they might, some schools call them a minor, there's varying different um, kind of uh, nomenclature of, of how to describe um, minors and majors and concentrations in college, but um, my understanding, and, and Dr. Peters and Dr. Farmer, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm looking at computer science specifically as concentrations in artificial intelligence, computer gaming, in cybersecurity, and then mechanical engineering as automotive engineering, bioengineering, um, CAD and CAM, computational fluid dynamics, uh, fuel efficient engine technologies, and sustainable energy are some of kind of the, the specific areas that you can dive into in those disciplines. So you could also like that as well. You could also choose to double major at times, as well as to take minors or concentrations. So that's one of the uh, things that where you really need to talk to somebody. Once you know where you want to go, talk to people at the school. Hopefully it'll be Kettering, but find out, well, this is what I want to do. What are the things that I need? And maybe you need one or two elective courses outside of your major discipline. Maybe you want to do a double major, but that's where the good advising comes in. Get to know your professors in college. We really don't bite. We are not fire-breathing dragons. Um, and we actually would much rather talk with you than do some of the uh, more boring parts of the job. So I would highly advise that you talk to faculty and say, this is what I think I want. What can you tell me about it? What classes should I take? How, how should I go about doing all of this decision-making and figuring out what it is I want to do? And I would add one thing, and that's that there's this debate between being really narrowly focused on something and being very broadly based. And I know that that's always something that a lot of students think about is I don't wanna be pigeonholed into just one career, but I do wanna be well prepared for my career. So there's a concept that actually the National Science Foundation looks at, which is depth and breadth. They want breadth over depth. So the idea there is that you should have a broad base of stuff that you know, and then one or two things where you go deeper and get to know it better. And that's where you're gonna build up your expertise. And that doesn't have to come instantly. You can start with that broad base and then you can go deeper as you figure out what you want. 
But the advantage of having that broad base to begin with is you're going to be working with other people. Dr. Farmer and I actually work with each other on a lot of stuff on auto drive, even though we're in very different disciplines. And if you have a good broad understanding, then you'll be able to work with people outside of your expertise and combine their expertise with yours and work as a team to accomplish even more. That's where the master's and PhD programs come into play, right? <laughs> yes, if you want to get very, 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 very deeply into things, there's the master's. Um, and then there is, is also the PhD, which is perhaps a little early for some of these students right. to think about it. Although if you want to ask professors about where they got their PhD and what their research was, trust me, you'll have to run away because we will talk about it. That's funny. There is um, one thing just putting on my admissions counselor cap really quick. Um, somebody asked a question regarding, you know, what can a student do if they are offered computer science classes in their school or something similar? Um, and I always like to point out pre-college programs. So here at Kettering, we have some really awesome programs that can be a day long, a weekend. Um, one I like to point out in particular, Lives Improved Through Engineering and Science. That is for women going into their senior year of high school where they're actually on campus for two weeks taking classes, doing field trips. Um, and it's kind of that those are the opportunities where you're not fully committed to anything, right? You're not paying for classes. It's just a two week long thing. And it, you know, you're interested in STEM, but it might help narrow what it is that really excites you about a particular program. Um, so like I said, Kettering has some really great ones, but I know a lot of you are out of state. I mean, check some of your local colleges, even your community colleges to see what they offer. Um, and I always like to plug in to do the job shadow. If you know somebody who has a job that you want, talk to them. Uh, chances are they'd be really excited to have you around uh, and, and answer those questions for you and show off what they do too. So just some things to keep in mind as we as we move forward. Um, yeah, and I just threw that link in there too for you, Bree. So thank you. Um, our pre-college programs actually range from, from K through 12, but they're, you know, I think most of the students here, you're, you're in high school. So there's varying um, kind of lengths, like, like Bree mentioned, but also kind of varying levels of, of you know, advanced curriculum, I guess you could say. So um, there, there's programs geared for rising seniors. There's programs for ninth and 10th graders. So be sure to check that out. And, and yeah, we'd love to have you here um, at Kettering for a course. And I guess we didn't mention it. We are in Michigan, Flint, Michigan, to, to be exact, uh, for those of you who are from various areas um, outside of the, the mitten. So yeah, I put that link in there. So check that out. And as we mentioned, other colleges offer good programs too, but ours are the best, so. <laughs> and Dr. Peters, I know you jumped in and answered this question, but I'll ask it out loud too. Um, somebody asked, when should a student start narrowing down their choices as far as the programs and majors they're interested in? Yeah, and that's something that uh, is a gradual process. And Dr. Farmer actually said that it's okay to change majors. So I would say if you're going in to your freshman year of college and you know you want STEM, you know you want some kind of engineering or computer science, that's a good enough starting point. Especially because if you look at the curriculum for mechanical, electrical, chemical engineering, computer science, a lot of your freshman year classes are the same. So you've got a little bit of time. It's not like you're losing a lot of territory. A lot of those areas, you're going to have to have a certain amount of math. You're going to have to have certain sciences. So you really don't need to decide instantly at 18 what you want to do for the rest of your life. You narrow it down and you figure it out as you go. It's kind of like driving at night. Your headlights don't show you all the way to the end of the road, but they show you the part ahead of you. And that's good enough for now. And when you get to the end of where your headlights show, they'll be showing you something further down. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that's the whole structure of, of, of college is that your first really year and a half, almost two years, is a lot of standard classes across majors. So like Calc 1 and 2 and Physics 1 and 2, and you can throw in a programming class too, so you have that under your belt, um, you know, communications classes and things like that. And so it's, it's very common. Uh, it's actually called general education, a lot of the, the chunk of it, um, because it, it's applicable for everybody. And, and But there's oftentimes for you to take a one or 200 level 
domain specific class like our programming one and there's there's classes like that like um there's a really cool um engineering intro to engineering class called ime 100 that you can take where you goof around with dex robotics and do things like that and learn how to do like um 3d printing and and fun stuff like that um so that'll give you a nice nice feel for things so take a couple classes like that in addition to the the traditional math and science and uh, communication stuff and that'll start to give you a, a, a you know kind of a look to the future um and then, you know, talk to other students, too. That's one of the key things, too, is I really, you know, just like I encourage you to join clubs in, in, in high school, join clubs when you get to Kettering or whatever school you get to. Join some clubs. Like, for example, Dr. Peters mentioned we have the auto drive uh, competition, which we're looking for every, every age group. It's not like we, you have to be a senior or a grad student or anything like that. We'll take everybody because, you know, the sooner you get in, on board, the, the, the more valuable you'll be over the, over the four years that you're here. Um, we also have really cool things like, like SA Baja, where you build like a doom buggy kind of thing and go racing around in the dirt. We have a really cool off-road um, area nearby Michigan, nearby Kettering where I used to go uh, dirt bike in a lot called the mounds. It's 240 acres, I think, of just sand and dunes. And it's the craziest fun thing. And that's where they take the buggy and go scooting around. Uh, we also have SE Formula One where they have a, um, I don't know if anybody's motorcyclists out there, but they actually have a 600cc single um, cylinder engine, which is just I can't imagine the torque that thing has. Um, and, and so you can work on that team and go racing around tracks and stuff. Um, there's just so many neat, neat club opportunities you can get involved with. We have an e, you know, eSports club, which is really big right now. Um, and the team's actually been doing really well. Um, so you can get involved in that. Um, and there's just, you know, really try to reach out and find something fun. And there's other fun clubs, like if you're a car person, you know, we have something called the Firebirds, I think it is, which is kind of just a car group that hangs out and, and talks car stuff. Um, my son's got a, a Mustang GT, so he hangs out with the, the car guys and, and he got you know, burner tires and they go spinning around the parking lot and stuff like that, doing donuts and drifting and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. So, you know, you, you can just have a blast that it's, you know, I'm kind of tired of paying for tires to be honest, but aside from that, it's really great opportunity for kids. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Lots of fun when you're in college too, in addition to your studies, right? Um, so yeah, so a couple of things I wanted to, to highlight um, or, or revisit. Um, at Kettering, being only 2,000 undergraduate students, you get to know your faculty pretty well. And so um, when you're having conversations, it, it, you know, I can't emphasize enough in, in terms of getting to know professors in college if, if the opportunity presents itself. And when you're at a small school like Kettering, it, it's kind of a, a, a must <laughs> that happens on a a regular basis, but when you talk to a professor and you say, you know, this really, you know, was an enjoyable, you know, unit of, of that class, and, and then they can help you maybe define a, a bit more um, focused, uh, you know, pathway moving forward for you. So those uh, mentors, academic advisors, faculty, um, you know, uh, resources can be quite valuable in the college experience to help these young people figure out what they, they want to do, as you guys have heard from from our two faculty here, they not only have um, a, a vast array of uh, experience in academia, but also industry. And so they can tell you how majoring in, in something will apply to 8 million careers, probably, if we really got into it. Um, but I wanted to talk about, too, one of our major programs that, uh, or one of our majors that was added fairly recently to, to the Kettering curriculum is my understanding. And that's um, a more generalist engineering major. And then the concentrations that that includes are engineering management, manufacturing systems, mechatronic systems, and robotic systems. So for, for this audience, you know, with maybe the theme of, of robotics, um, I think we're, we're fairly unique in that we do have a, that this engineering major that isn't specific to electrical or chemical or industrial. It's kind of um, all encompassing. Of, of those programs. And then you have this specific, if it is in a specific discipline, I guess it, it aligns most closely, at least my understanding is, and so correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> in fact, it aligns most closely with what a systems engineering type program would be maybe at other schools. But I did want to throw out that, that there is, you know, some, some majors in college 
that are designed to be broad and allow the, the student to, to explore and, and figure out what uh, type of engineering really, really hits home and, and is something they, they really enjoy. Um, so yeah, so I don't know if there's anything you guys wanted to add about that. Hopefully I did that, that major program kind of justice, but that's a new venture <laughs> for Kettering. Um, so something you can look for uh, that might be out there at, at other places too. And it's, it's very popular doing. too. It's a very popular mm -hmm. nature right now. I did want to jump on, on, on uh, Nate's comment about, you know, being a small school and things like that. Um, just a quick story as we're, we're wrapping up. My daughters, I encourage both of them to go to small schools. And, you know, my son's going here to Kettering. Um, and my oldest daughter, after uh, um, her first year in college, they, she met up with all her buddies from high school and they were sitting around chit chatting and a couple of, one of them asked the group, hey, have any of you had a professor in any of your classes yet? And they're like, no. And Melissa, that's her name, my daughter's name. She was puzzled, goes, well, what do you mean? She goes like a real professor. Have you had a real professor in any of your classes yet? And she's like, I had a real professor in every single one of my classes so far. Um, whereas the larger, really big, big schools, you tend to not see them until your junior year, honestly. They, they, they um, don't teach the lower level courses. They usually have um, lectures and things and grad students fill in and teach the lower level courses. Uh, but at Kettering, your first class with us with, will be with a professor you know um your last class will be with a professor we have some lectures and things that interspersed in particularly often to cover like a special topic that we want to teach here and there but you will have a one-on-one -on -one experience with professors and like if you take if you become a computer scientist our programming one we have we cap the class at 15. The most you can have in your class is 15 students. If you take programming one at a, at a big state school, you'll probably get between two and 400 kids in your class. Um, so, you know, do the math. You know, uh, I don't know what 400 divided by 15 is, but it's a really still a really big number. Um, so, <laughs> So, and, and that's, that, that, you know, it ties into, too, Nate talked about talk to professors. If there's only a dozen you in the class with a professor, it's pretty hard not to talk to the person, right? Um, I mean, it's really hard not to talk to the person. And you'll get to know people on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I've had, you know, students who are in multiple classes with faculty. When they graduate, they're, they're just like family. I mean, they literally know so much about that. How's your dog, right? You know, um, things like that, because they know so much about, about the students. And you just don't get that at larger schools. I mean, they have resources to do other cool things like, you know, 100,000 people football stadium and stuff that we don't have. But as far as the one-on-one -on -one experience and really getting to know faculty and, and, and getting a relationship with faculty, that's that's just going to be unique. I, you know, the classes are even smaller than what you saw in high school, right? So um, the bad news is you can't skimp on not doing homework and stuff, right? Because they'll know. <laughs> but they will get to know you and you'll get to know them very, very well. And, and I just can't stress enough how important that is, particularly if you go on and want to go to grad school. When we write a letter of recommendation, we know so much about our students that it can be a really glowing, personalized letter that the admissions committee reads and goes, wow, this this person has really lit the world on fire. Wow. Um, and you just can't get that that same sort of one-on-one -on -one interaction with the with other larger schools. So, you know, I, I really encourage you to, to think hard about that because when, when you have classes capped with such small numbers, there's just nothing like it. it. It really is your education at that point. It's not like you are fitting into a into a cog, you know, a big system, you know, this little cog and this giant thing. It is your education. You can tailor it to, to your needs, your learning style, your questioning style, everything. It's it's just such a unique, unique opportunity. Thank you so much. And just a quick note, uh, Dr. Peter did mention a good point about Society of Women Engineers. A lot of clubs and colleges will offer additional scholarships too. So keep that in mind. Awesome. Well, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, after you close out this window, a quick five question survey will appear. Please feel free to answer that. Um, any feedback is always welcome. Also, please feel free to check our website. There are more sessions for the rest of the week. And last but not least, the recordings will be available at strivescan.com slash cache. And thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you for having us.